I'm going to go ahead and get started. Today, we're going to be talking about AC and DC coupling of a PV system and how it relates to Simplify products. So we will be offering NABCEP credits today. Uh, if that's something you need, please make sure to stick around until the end. I'll be showing that email. You can send me an email and request NABCEP credits. Make sure to put your full name in that email so that I can spell it right on your credit. Beyond that, if you have a question, uh, we'll have plenty of time for question and answer today. So make sure to pop your question into the Q&A section of the screen there. It should be either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on your layout. And I don't think there's anything else. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Jump in at any time with questions, guys. I'll try to answer them as fast as I can. But if I don't get to them, I will at the end of the presentation for sure. All right. So to begin with a little bit of the company history and a background of our growth and success, we were founded in 2010 under the name OES Energy. Uh, we also made Liberty Pack products. So this is basically explaining that we were born into the mobile power pack industry. We were making things for Hollywood filmmakers. You know, we were beginning with some very hardcore applications for an early stage company. Our products are still in the field with these other logos outliving their warranties. So you may see us in the field at residences as OES Energy or in film studios as Liberty Pack. These items are outliving their warranty already. In 2011, we actually bid on a military project that specifically stated they did not want lithium batteries involved. However, after convincing them to do some testing of our product, we were able to um, display to them how safe our products were, winning the contract, a big step forward for lithium batteries at the time, which were just seen as a big fire hazard, and a step beyond lead acid batteries, which just really had a lot of performance drawbacks for military applications. We also began working in emergency response and residential at that time. Now, we're all really passionate here about the environment and sustainability. And so working in emergency response is really important to a lot of people here. In 2013, we began expanding our product line. I'd argue that we're still doing that to this day. We're always considering what does the installer need to get the job done quickly and provide all the needs of the customer. In 2015, we relaunched as Simplify Power, and ever since then, we've been ramping up manufacturing at our Ventura County, California location, which is where we do our engineering design and manufacturing. The problem we see right now that we're trying to solve is a limited access to safe, reliable, affordable, and sustainable power. So what I mean by that is something that we're all seeing all across the U.S. We've been seeing electricity prices rise over 15 percent in the last 10 years. Now, I pay up to 45 cents per kilowatt hour in California in the you know, highest time of use rate. This is not isolated to the U.S. as we're seeing European prices do the same as they phase out coal and nuclear. There's infrastructure failing everywhere. I mean, we've got several customers using our products because their transformer is old and it's you know not able to support the power and EV needs, or they're at the end of a very long transmission line and their power, the frequency that the grid provides them and their power is not stable. So infrastructure everywhere is failing and there's a need for decarbonization that is growing. You know, cities are demanding that in 2030, 2050, varying dates, they're going to have a carbon neutral grid. And they often don't have a clear path to meet this goal. So that's where we come in. Distributed assets are the solution to all of these problems, right? Distributing customers with the control over their power. 
So as an overview of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about AC and DC coupling. So AC and DC coupling relates to how solar panels are coupled or connected to the battery bank. AC coupling means you're taking AC power that's coming off the roof. So the PV array is immediately inverted to AC power, and then later it may be converted back to DC power for battery charging. DC coupling is when you're using DC power from the PV array, and that's going straight to the batteries, still as DC power. Now there is a charge controller in between, of course, maintaining the batteries and, you know, perfecting their health and charge cycles, but that power is never converted to AC power before it reaches the batteries. So we're gonna dive in a bit deeper here. We're gonna talk more first about DC coupling. <clears throat> So DC coupling means you are using DC power all the way from the generation source straight down to the batteries. So to do this, you have a charge controller. That charge controller is not only going to maintain the batteries and you know, charge at the proper voltages and limit current if necessary, it's also going to optimize the power production of the renewable source like a PV array. A PV panel or a wind turbine as well, even hydro. When you are laying out your PV array and using a charge controller, your DC coupling, some things you want to keep in mind to optimize power production are shading, uh, specifications, and weather, right? So if you have all your panels in a series string, and one of those panels has a tree covering it, so it's completely shaded, the output of that panel is zero, zero watts, zero amps. And then in turn, the output of the rest of the string of panels is also dead, it's also zero. Now the reason for that is think of it like a water pipe. If you have a valve in the middle of that pipe that then gets shut, the entire pipe, even though there's water in it, the water cannot flow. And that's basically what happens when a single solar panel gets shaded in a string. Now, another thing to consider is the specifications, right? So looking at your panels, adding up the open circuit voltage of all the panels in series, adding up the short circuit current of all the panels in parallel, and making sure that those don't exceed the maximum current or voltage your charge controller can handle. Now, it's also not quite as simple as just looking at the number on the panel and then the number on the charge controller. For example, the open circuit voltage of a panel can drastically change. It goes up quite a bit in really cold weather. So what's going to happen in cold weather is that panel's open circuit voltage is going to increase and that can damage the PV charge controller if it increases too high. So you really wanna have some wiggle room in there uh, between 10 and 25% uh, depending on your environment. So how does a charge controller actually do this? How does it actually regulate the DC voltage and current going to the battery bank and the charge and from the PV array? One thing is you're going to be able to program it. You know, you're gonna be able to program it to hit the exact DC voltage your battery wants, the timers or finish current requirements. You're gonna be able to limit the current going to the battery bank. It can accept sources such as PV, wind, or hydro, really anything that's a DC power source. The way it's going to do this is there's two main uh, types of charge controllers. One is called MPPT, that stands for Maximum Power Point Tracking, and the other is known as PWM, which is Pulse Width Modulation. These are two different ways that the solar panel or the charge controller regulates voltage and current. So an MPPT is gonna detect solar panel output 
in real time to maximize the voltage, uh, excuse me, the battery power. So what it's going to do is constantly track that solar panel IV curve, always looking for the point of maximum power where voltage times current is the max. So let's say your solar panel string is sitting at 75 volts and it's the middle of the day, your MPPT is going to bump up the voltage to 75.2 and then see, is there any extra power coming in from this array? No, okay, back down to, now we're gonna go to 74.8 volts. Is there any additional power coming in from this array? No, okay, we're gonna go back to 75 where there was the most power coming in from this array. So that's essentially how the MPPT uh, tracks the maximum power point is it's always moving up and down to find that point of maximum power. And this is up to 99% efficient. So 99% is extremely efficient, losing only 1% in conversion. Now we'll say this is a little bit of an optimistic estimate. If you have a very small array or if your array is only producing uh, half power that the charge controller can handle, it's not gonna be quite 99% efficient. That charge controller wants to see more of a fuller load. Now, what does a PWM do? A PWM charge controller will modify the quote unquote pulse width to appropriately charge the battery. So what does this mean? That instead of providing the battery with uh, 56 volts constantly, it may, may actually provide 60 volts for a very short burst and then open circuit and close circuit very quickly so that the load or a battery in this case sees an actual average of 56 volts, for example. So it's gonna open and close the uh, circuit very, very quickly to modify that average voltage seen by the load instead of actually modifying the voltage uh, as a whole. So if it needs to reduce current, again, it can just reduce the width of these pulse pulses. It's going to use something like a FET usually to pulse that quickly. It happens many, many times per second. And this uses a little bit of power, so it's not quite as efficient as an MPPT in most cases. But there are still very valid uses for PWM charge controllers. A lot of people think they're just going on a style. They're not. They're very affordable and they're used for smaller size systems, less than a kilowatt commonly. If you're under a kilowatt, the efficiency here is not gonna make a big difference and you could go either way between PWM or MPPT. To give you an example of the system design, talking about you know, where everything lands, it's gonna all land on this DC bus. DC bus is highlighted here in red. So not only are your batteries gonna land on here, your charge controller and your inverter are also both gonna land on here. So what does this mean? Is that the charge controller output is gonna charge the batteries. And then if the batteries are completely full, they're just going to be floating on the charge controller, which is basically allowing the charge controller to send power directly to the loads bypassing the battery. Awesome, so we talked a little more about DC coupling. Let's dive into AC coupling a little deeper as well. AC coupling means that there's AC power coming right off the roof. So in most cases, people are using microinverters, which is a single inverter on each solar panel to optimize the power production and put it to 240 volts. And it's also going to convert it to AC instead of DC. So all these microinverters are essentially going to be in parallel. So really there's no need for, you know, shading considerations. If one panel gets shaded, uh, the whole array is unaffected beyond that one panel. So this is one nice thing about AC coupling, specifically when you're using microinverters, is that you don't have to worry about the arrangement of your panels as far as shading. Now there's another way to accomplish 
AC coupling, which is a string inverter. So you're essentially having a large string of several panels in series or parallel, and then that string is going to connect directly to an inverter like the Sphronius that is on the wall instead of on the roof, and it's not connected to each panel. Again, it's connected to a string of panels. So in this type of layout, again, the current would be reduced if you had a single panel shaded. Why would people ever use a string inverter over a micro inverter if they're going to have to worry about shading and even the length of the wire run and current losses and stuff like that? The reason they would use a string inverter is because if that thing ever breaks, they just replace one of them on the side of the wall instead of going up all the way on the roof and checking out each panel. At that point, you must you might as well rewire the whole array because it's going to be a big bill. So using a string inverter can be sometimes cheaper, uh, sometimes just as effective if there's no shading concerns, and certainly easier to replace. In any case, you're going to need a battery-based inverter if you want to add batteries to a system. So if your PV array, whether AC or DC coupled, uh, is going to be having batteries added to it, you will need a battery-based inverter. That inverter is going to take AC power from the array to charge the battery or from the grid even to charge the battery. And it's also going to take battery power, convert that from DC to AC power so you can use it in the loads in your home. Now we'll look at some layouts here of what AC coupled systems look like but one point to make is that using a generator is really effectively the same as AC coupling a PV array. It connects into all the same places. Uh, usually the generator port on the inverter you're using is interchangeable between an AC coupled array and a generator. They're both power sources and they're not going to consume any power in their operation. One thing that we should talk about today is frequency shifting. So how does the battery-based inverter control the power output of the micro-inverters or the string inverter? So think about that for a second. The grid goes down and everything sees that there's no grid signal coming in. So all the microinverters or string inverters have to shut off completely. They have to be turned off so that they don't send power to, to the grid, which would damage the lines potentially and harm employees. So in order to turn that array back on so that you can continue to produce power to charge your battery bank, what has to happen is that the battery-based inverter has to send a signal to the microinverters, letting them know, hey, you know, faking that the grid is still alive. So they're sending that 60 hertz, 240 volts up to the microinverters, saying, hey, turn, turn yourself back on, keep producing power, we got batteries to charge. Now, another scenario to think about. The grid is still down, the batteries are charging, and they're getting full, very full. And the battery-based inverter wants to turn those inverters down slightly. It doesn't want to charge the batteries quite as fast, but it doesn't want to shut off entirely. One thing that several battery-based inverters can do is shift the frequency just slightly to, instead of 60 hertz, maybe 60.1 hertz or 60.2 hertz. And what will happen is the grid-tied inverters, you know, the micro or string inverters, they will actually reduce the production, the amount of power they're producing to charge the battery bank a little slower. And then if the battery bank becomes entirely 100% full, they will then increase the frequency to a range that's unusable by the microinverters, such as 62 Hertz, for example, causing everything to shut down entirely. So any questions on frequency shifting? How long does it take for the battery inverter to send the signal to grid-tied inverters that the grid is actually on when it's not actually on? 
That's a great question. Um, usually it takes, I believe, five minutes after the grid goes down until that battery base inverter even starts sending that signal. Once it starts sending that signal, it should take an additional amount of a few minutes for the microinverters to kind of qualify that AC source, make sure it's operating normally. So that's a, that's a great question. The um, Another question, do computer loads lose power unless you have a local UPS to serve them? So that's a great question. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. There's different system layouts, but you definitely can back up your computers such that they don't lose power in an outage if you have batteries. I think one thing a lot of people don't even realize is that if they have an AC coupled PV array, uh, with no batteries, uh, so actually that would just be called a grid tied PV array, it's not going to remain on in an outage. You're not going to have power being produced unless you have batteries. So that can be a rude awakening sometimes. So this is what I mean. You have just a grid tied PV array, for example, here we've got microinverters, they're connected to a sub panel and then directly into the main grid panel. What's gonna happen here when the grid goes down is absolutely nothing. These are just gonna shut off and remain off until the grid turns back on. Now, when you go to retrofit this system and add in batteries and a battery-based inverter, it's really easy to do because all this equipment for an AC coupled array is already outdoors. And we offer basically a pre-packaged uh, system that can go outdoors and is ready to be AC coupled. What this allows your customer to do is send a signal from the battery-based inverter to the microinverters, keep them online, and disconnect from the grid. In addition, you can move any loads you want backed up during an outage to this critical loads panel, so it'll continue to be powered in an outage from the microinverters and from the um, battery-based inverter, in, even in a, the case of an outage. Let's continue to look at some different applications we can cover with both AC and DC coupling, kind of look at what's best for what case scenario. When you are talking about DC coupling, this is really common for off-grid. This is gonna help you maximize your solar production, have a very efficient system. Um, there's really no reason not to install a brand new off-grid system with DC coupled. Uh, unless it's massive and there's some shading concerns, then it makes a lot more sense to have an off-grid system be DC coupled. With a battery backup system, you might see a hybrid system. You might see a grid tied system with a uh, DC coupled PV array. The main reason for this is it's actually a little easier to accomplish charging using PV during a grid outage. So if you look at you know, the microinverters being tied into that grid panel, they're gonna wanna shut off in an outage and then need to be turned back on by the battery base inverter. Whereas, what's gonna happen with a DC coupled array, it's not even going to notice that the grid goes down, right? The, the power goes down, but the batteries are still outputting 48 volts or whatever they're outputting. The PV array and the charge controller are on an entirely separate side of the system than all the grid equipment and load equipment. So they don't even, you know, PV array doesn't even notice what's happening on this side of the system. So it's a little more seamless. There's no turn on, turn off time as uh, someone had asked earlier. DC coupling also gives you a little more control over your power, right? So when, when you're AC coupled, all that AC power is on one bus. There's an AC bus for both the loads, the grid and the generator or AC coupled array. Whereas with DC coupled, you really have control over this other side of your system. The DC side is totally separate. So you do have a little more control over features such as time of use, 
peak load shaving and even selling to grid to maybe do some time of use arbitrage, you can sell power when it's expensive and buy it back when it's cheap. Now you can still do all those things with AC coupling. You're just slightly limited sometimes in terms of functionality. Now in terms of large scale commercial and industrial, it's really a mixed bag here uh, in terms of AC versus DC coupling. There are massive DC to DC converters um, that are sometimes used in commercial applications. Size of a small shed we're talking, these things are huge. We've got PV array considerations. Really important to remember, DC coupling can be affected by things like shading. One way around that is to use DC optimizers so that they actually maximize the power production of each panel and the bank as a whole. They're not gonna allow one panel to kill the output of the whole array. But these can get expensive when you're adding them onto each panel. It's similar to a microinverter cost. Another thing to consider is rapid shutdown. That might help you decide between AC and DC coupling. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go on. So I'm not gonna harp on that right now. As far as AC coupling, you may see this very commonly used in grid tight applications. Now the reason for this is because customers often will get only solar to begin with no batteries, and then later down the road, they'll retrofit the system to add batteries. Now, if you're installing a brand new system, I think generally it's usually more efficient and effective to do DC coupling. But if you've got an existing array, it doesn't make sense to rewire the whole array just to switch from an AC coupled existing system to a DC coupled system. It just doesn't make sense financially. In terms of large scale commercial and industrial, this makes for usually an easier installation of PV arrays and slightly even more efficient as you're often just sending power directly to the grid in these commercial and industrial systems. Maybe you're not storing it in batteries so the efficiency is just one conversion directly to AC power and then right to the grid instead of where you'd have the charge controller. On a DC coupled system, you'd have the charge controller loss in and out of the batteries potentially, and then finally that AC conversion before sending to the grid. So if you're just sending power directly to the grid, you know whether you're a homeowner or a commercial slash industrial customer, AC coupling is gonna be more efficient for that. I think what some people don't realize as homeowners that you're not really using power immediately when it's produced. You know, in the middle of the day, when the sun is high, and it's clear skies, you're not really home. The only thing running is your couple hundred watts of refrigeration and maybe 50 watts for your internet router. Uh, maybe you leave a light on. There's not much running when you're not home. And when you get home in the evening or the mornings, PV is not producing at that time. So I think it's a little bit misleading to think that, oh, you're just gonna use this PV to power loads and send power to the grid directly. If you're using it in your home, often it's more efficient to DC couple. As far as use case limitations, uh, there can be a little bit of a limitation depending on your inverter. It may or may not be able to have time of use settings. It may or may not have self con consumption or peak shaving if you're AC coupling. And the reason for that is it's all on one bus, right? So that AC power coming in from the array, sometimes it's hard for the inverter to distinguish where that power is coming from and going. It's also hard sometimes for the inverter to decide, uh, you know, is it buying or selling power during time of use? It's just going to kind of open that contact to avoid buying power. Again, this is not an issue with all inverters, but some inverters do have limitations when you're AC coupling. Really, um, main point of this slide is to explain that when you've got an existing system, there used to be a myth that you could not DC couple a grid tied system. That myth really just results from the 
economics of the scenario, it doesn't make sense to rewire a whole array that's already AC coupled to be DC coupled just because there's a little more efficiency. Really, you'd have to swap um, a lot of equipment out and re redo a lot of wiring runs. Wiring runs are another thing you have to consider for DC coupled systems. So this is something you'd be able to kind of avoid explaining to your customer and just say, oh, it's not possible. So that, that myth kind of derived from economics. It is possible to retrofit a grid tied system uh, to be DC coupled, and it's possible to install a brand new DC coupled system on the grid, no problem. There are several differences when it comes to rapid shutdown between the systems. So today I'm going to talk about rapid shutdown, but know that I am not the authority on this. Your AHJ or your city or county, they are the ones responsible for giving you the final word on rapid shutdown requirements as it relates to the PV array. So note that when you're DC coupling, um, Often, if you have a ground mount array, you can get off, get away with just a shutoff box. You may not need module level shutdown because if those panels are not on your house, there's no way a firefighter is going to be over there swinging an axe trying to hop through your roof, right? So if they're not on your house, you may be able to avoid module level shutdown, which is an added expense and an added component on your system. If you do need module shutdown, which if your panels are going on a roof, there's almost 100% chance that you will, there's a couple ways you can do that. There are some rapid shutdown only PV attachments. So all they do is turn the panel off when they're supposed to. And there's an alternative solution, which is a DC optimizer. This is a little more expensive, but what it's gonna do is optimize the power coming from each panel and keep one panel that's shaded in the string from killing the output of the whole array. These are popular, again, because it can kind of ease your shading concerns, but again, it does add an expense that can be really sometimes preventative. There's multiple ways to accomplish this. I find that the most popular way to accomplish this is there's a single button shutdown on the solar converter. So, some jurisdictions are requiring that a firefighter must be able to enter the room, press a button on the inverter, have the inverter shut down, have the inverter disconnect from the battery bank, disconnect from the PV array, and disconnect from the grid. And the solar converter does currently have that rapid shutdown compliance. Another way you can do this is by using midnight remote trip breakers, for example, just one example of a breaker that you can press a button and that PV array somewhere else will disconnect. So again, it's really just about providing firefighters ease of access to your, you know, disconnecting your system so they don't get injured. As far as AC coupling, um, if you've got a micro inverter or a string inverter, and you're adding an inline battery-based inverter, you're not touching that array. You're not touching any of those components. You're just moving their outputs around. Instead of, their, instead of them landing on the grid panel, now they're gonna land on your battery-based inverter. If that's all you're doing, it's probably not going to change the rapid shutdown compliance of your existing PV array. But if you're doing more than that, such as replacing a string inverter, uh, you may need DC optimizers. You may need something on each panel. Luckily, if you've got micro inverters, that is your rapid shutdown compliance. Those are gonna turn off each panel in an outage or whenever the firefighters disconnect the system. This is also able to be handled with the single button shutdown on the Solark. So again, another disclaimer, check with your local jurisdiction, check with your inspector in terms of what they wanna see for your system's rapid shutdown. So here's what I'm talking about. This is a single line example of a DC coupled array. In this case, you've got the Tygo 
modules and the Tygo transmitter. Now what happens here is the Solark sends a 12 volt signal to this transmitter. The PV wires run through the transmitter's little donut there. And if that transmitter ever turns off, if it ever stops receiving a 12 volt signal from the Solark, the PV array modules are gonna see that it's no longer on, it's no longer sending them a signal to stay alive, and they're gonna immediately shut down. So it's this transmitter that keeps the module level units alive. In addition to that, uh, you're pretty much always going to need some sort of a PV array shut off so that you can turn the system on and off without shutting down the entire you know, inverter and loads. This is kind of just an example of the single button that you could use. Um, as far as an AC coupled system, it doesn't change too much, except this is maybe an example where you don't need that single button shutdown for everything. You may have simply a shutoff box and that may be all you need. So there's a lot of stuff we talked about today, differences between AC and DC coupled. We're gonna talk about how it changes your system design and layout when you're choosing between the two. When you are DC coupling, you will be limited to smaller strings. You know, not everything can be in parallel, so you will have to have kind of a, you know, a bunch of panels adding voltage in series. And there's always kind of a max voltage you can reach, be able to couple that uh, string to the charge controller. Most of the largest charge controllers on the market are handling up to 600 volts DC open circuit voltage. So that is your limitation there. If you need a lot more power, you know, in series beyond that, you're gonna need more strings of panels. This is gonna cause you to use a lot of wiring and often to use combiners to combine those strings so that you don't have 16 wires landing on your charge controller. Wiring runs are really important to consider here. This is something we haven't talked a lot about yet, but it's very important. If you've got 10 amps flowing through a 14 gauge wire over a hundred foot distance, you're gonna lose a whole lot of that power, right? There's a voltage drop across that wire and an efficiency loss of power being produced by the panels and then just burning up, turning to heat within the wire. You really want to avoid that loss and limit it to 3% or hopefully even less. So you can simply check the voltage drop from one end of the wire to the other, although that's a lot harder than it actually sounds. My recommendation would be to use a chart like the one that Blue Sea Systems provides for DC wire gauge charts. Um, this is gonna help you decide, okay, I've got 10 amps flowing through a wire. The wire run is 100 feet long. I'm gonna need at least a eight or a 10 gauge wire, for example. Um, check out those charts to avoid having an inefficient system. Okay, when you are AC or DC coupling, you're really gonna want a critical loads panel for keeping those loads alive during a grid outage. If the grid goes down and all your loads are on the main panel, exactly where the grid lands, how is your system going to send power to that panel? So let's let's go back here. If all your loads are on this panel on the right and the grid is directly connected to that panel, your inverter cannot send power to that panel in an outage. So that's why it's important to um, move over any loads you want to back up to the other side of the system where the critical loads panel is. This can continue to be powered in an outage without you know, risking harming utility workers. So some design considerations from AC coupled. We have talked about this a lot, but just to stress, really this is gonna allow less wiring, larger strings, and a much easier design. You don't have to really worry about shading too much here throughout the day as conditions change. 
one or two panels may be shaded, it's not going to kill the output of your whole array. As far as you know, larger systems, I'm really not an expert here, um, but one thing to consider again is, are you using micro inverters or string inverters? Because if you're using string inverters on a large system, you're still gonna have that you know, design consideration of avoiding shading. If you're using a uh, micro inverter, it's going to be a lot easier, faster installation, especially for a large scale system. So let's talk about some key features of our products and how it relates. We use only lithium iron phosphate chemistry and cylindrical form factor cells. We don't use pouch cells or prismatic cells. Pouch cells can be a little bit more fragile, prone to swelling, puncture, not something we wanna use for a large scale system or residential systems at all. Um, however, prismatic cells can be a great option. Unfortunately for our form factor, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense for the layout, I'm not able to fit as much power in the space using those cells. And uh, they're a little bit more limited in their life cycle and protection capabilities. When we look at cylindrical, it is the safest form factor look at it it's a steel wrapped cell there's short circuit protection built in it's able to handle a high amount of pressure and temperature um, really it's just a sturdy long lasting piece of equipment so we use lithium iron phosphate and cylindrical form factors across the board throughout all of our products to our smallest jenny units that are portable and then our largest battery units that you see on the screen One thing that's important with AC or DC coupled systems, but especially with grid, si grid tied systems, uh, anything where the, you're gonna be inspected is you're gonna need a UL listing. So your inspector is gonna wanna make sure your product has been safety tested by a third party. For us, that third party is the, U the underwriters lab. They not only create the tests and the protocols, but often they perform the tests for us as well. This is going to help ensure that your insurance company doesn't have an issue with the products you install. It's going to help make sure you pass inspection. It's going to meet building and fire codes and just make sure to check with your AHJ to know what's required in terms of products and UL listings before you install them. A lot of products on the market have one UL listing but not another, whereas your inspector may require a very specific listing. Now I can tell you from experience of working on a lot of project projects all around the nation here with Simplify products that we are always on the leading edge of safety certifications. We are, it's so important to what we do here is, is keeping our customers safe, ensuring that our products are not able to even start a fire or have a serious thermal runaway spread across the whole system. It's not gonna happen. So. I can assure you that we are always one of the first to meet the needs of a new certification when it becomes available. So we'll do a quick overview of our products. This is our 3.8 kilowatt hour battery. It's modular and scalable. 151 amp hours at 24 volts and 75 amp hours at 48 volts. This battery is very simple battery. It's able to be DC or AC coupled. And you will of course need a battery based inverter to tend to it in either case. Really batteries often don't care whether they're AC or DC coupled. Um, they, they should be able to function perfectly either way because they are seeing DC power only. It's, it's the other equipment that you pair with them, like the battery-based inverter and the charge controller that really matter. It's those pieces of equipment that are the question as to whether you can AC or DC couple. Now note, if you are using microinverters, 
or a string inverter and you're frequency shifting to control them, you probably will need a 48 volt battery and a 48 volt battery based inverter. As far as newer products, we have our Amplify battery. This is the same form factor. It's 3.8 kilowatt hours at 48 volts. This is really the same battery, similar internals. It's just a stronger and more intelligent BMS. You can communicate with both the Solark and Sunny Island inverters with this battery right now. And the advantage of having communications is it's going to auto-populate a lot of the settings for your customer. So it's going to make sure that you aren't able to mess anything up in terms of programming. It's also going to tell the inverter if there's a very small battery bank. So it's going to limit the charge and discharge rate that the battery-based uh, inverter can provide to the battery. So for example, with our five batteries, if you've got an eight or nine kilowatt inverter, you need at least five batteries to fully power that inverter and be able to accept a fast charge from it. If you've got one Amplify battery, your charge control, or excuse me, your inverter will limit itself in its charge and discharge power of the battery bank automatically. So you don't have to worry about sizing the system um, in terms of the battery will protect itself. Now, in addition to set points, this battery is also going to show your customer an accurate state of charge, voltage, and temperature, as well as accurate current readings that are both real-time and historic data through Solark's PowerView and Sunny Island's monitoring setup as well. So this is going to display to your customer, you know, what's going on with the system, what percentage charge do they have remaining, kind of like a fuel gauge. And it's also gonna help us with troubleshooting should that ever be needed. Another advantage of the Amplify battery here, wrapping it up is that it's got a high level of protection for cold temperatures. So as that temperature drops, the battery is going to automatically tell the inverter to reduce the charge rate as it gets very close to freezing. And for if for any reason the temperature drops below freezing and the battery is still being charged, it's simply going to open circuit to protect itself. All right, so our access systems. This is simply a outdoor rated NEMA 3R cabinet with batteries built in and a charge controller or inverter built in. So this is something where we can install the Schneider XW Pro 6848 or the Solark, Solark 12K. Both of these would be AC coupling and DC coupling capable, though with the Schneider, make sure to add on that charge controller. We can add that in for you. It's a 600 volt charge controller, so you can have the largest PV strings you can with a DC coupled system. Uh, the Solark MPPT built in is two MPPTs. It's a very high voltage controller. I believe it goes up to 550 volts. So that's another good option there. These are perfect for retrofitting grid tied systems because it's got the latest rapid shutdown um, features. As we mentioned with the Solar, it's got that single button and being outdoor rated makes your installation a lot easier. Uh, you're not gonna have to fish any wires through the wall. You can do everything as your equipment's probably already all outside. These do function as an automatic transfer. Uh, when the grid goes down, it is a UPS, so an uninterrupted power source. That means, uh, like we had a question on earlier, you will be able to com com uh, keep certain loads online if you move them over to a critical loads panel, even when the grid goes down, they're not even going to see that outage because it transfers from grid to battery power so fast. Additionally, these are all UL 9540 and 9540A certified. So the, the access solar system is 9540A and you will be able to install that even in very strict jurisdictions with fire safety protocols. 
the Schneider. I don't believe we've gone through that testing with the Schneider, but if you need that, let us know and we'll get, we'll look into that for you. There is a limit of how much PV you can couple to these. Um, note that if you're AC coupling with the Schneider access, uh, you'll be able to use 5.7 kW for three battery version, 6.8 kW for a four battery version, and for the Solar 12K, 7.6 kilowatt limit. Now, we do have several design tools to help you succeed as a customer, or excuse me, as an installer, showing the customer why they need what equipment they need. For example, we've got a battery bank sizing estimator. We've actually got three of them now. So this is a very simple version. Um, this sizing tool specifically is gonna take into account more of the system equipment. So you'll enter in what inverter and what charge controller the system has, and it's gonna spit out what type of batteries you need and how many. With the lead acid replacement calculator, this is going to take into account the size of an existing lead acid bank your customer has and make sure you match the usable kilowatt hours in terms of comparing depth of discharge and all that. <coughs> In addition to our manual spec sheets, integration guides, and calculators that I just showed you, we've also got an amazing pre-sales support and technical support team for helping you both design a system and install the system and troubleshoot if anything comes up. So don't hesitate to call us. We really don't leave anyone on hold. Actually, we don't even have a hold line on our tech support line. It's either, you know, we pick up right away or we call you back in just a couple minutes. We really pick up quite quickly and our technicians are trained both in the field and behind the desk. So really this is something that not a lot of companies are offering this type of support. Nearing the end here, I want to touch on one last thing, which is our IQ program. If you're already installing our batteries, there's a no brainer here. Make sure to join our program so that we can promote you. We're gonna add you to this map and show customers where they can find you. And this allows customers to find people near them. It also allows our sales team to route leads to the nearest installer. We're gonna put your photos in our newsletter if you'd like. We got plenty of opportunities on our social media for you. And I can even sometimes display your photos in our trainings. In addition, we've recently launched a program to give $25 cash back per battery installed if you're joining our IQ program. So if, if you're installing our batteries already, again, this is a real no brainer. Um, we even have a $250 photo contest each month so make sure to send in your photos and we will enter them in. So lastly, I want to say thank you. I want to put up my email. So if you need NAPSEP credits, now's your time. Email me with your full name, just asking, hi, my name is blank. I'd like NAPSEP credits and I'll get them over to you uh, within about 48 hours. So please be patient. And lastly, I'm going to jump into the Q&A here and answer any questions. Um, it's found an error in my slides. So um, the slide must have said that the open circuit voltage decreases under cold weather. Actually, it's going to increase. So again, your open circuit voltage of your solar panel is going to increase when it gets cold. And if the voltage of this uh, entire string gets higher than what the charge controller can handle, it will most likely destroy that charge controller. Good catch. All right, question from Alan. So if you have all your panels in series and one of them is shaded, this is similar to closing a valve on a water pipe. No water can flow through that pipe just as no current can flow through the wire um, of that solar panel. So the entire string is in 
on the same wire, right? So that wire, if no current is flowing from one of the panels, no current can flow through that panel at all from any of the rest of the panels either. Uh, current is the same in series and current adds in parallel. So if all of your panels are in parallel and one of them gets shaded, that's no problem at all. That one panel is dead and the rest are still producing power. But if they're in series, that kill all power production. Are the frequencies used for frequency shifting standardized across all inverter manufacturers? It's a complicated answer, yes and no. Um, there is definitely a, a standard, but not all inverters have the capability to perform at a lower output when frequency shifting. Some of them just have on and off, and that's totally fine. Uh, but if they do have the ability to decrease power production, you know, across a certain range of frequencies, yes, those frequencies are standardized, but you still need to confirm with your manufacturers that they're compatible with each other. You know, again, some may not have that capability. I was late this morning. Will a recording of the webinar be sent out after it ends? Yes, for all those who, who registered today, you will get a recording of this webinar. How do you manage AC coupling, giving Simplify is a 48 volt battery? Um, this is gonna be handled by the battery-based inverter. So the battery itself, it's only going to see DC power. That battery-based inverter, like the Solark or the Schneider, they're the ones taking the power from the inverter and converting it to DC 48 volt power for the battery. Good question. So Gail has a question about rapid shutdown. I'm not sure I understand your question fully, Gail, but basically in a power in a rapid shutdown event, the firefighter is going to disconnect that uh, inverter and it's going to stop power from going to any of the loads from the batteries because the battery power has to travel through the inverter to get to the loads. So yes, all power to the loads would be stopped in a rapid shutdown event. Question, does Simplify manufacture its own cells? We do not. We use cells and assemble them with other components. Question from Peter, is closed loop for Schneider coming soon? You know, I believe it's on our list. Not exactly sure when we're gonna have that completed. What's the current recommendation for cell voltage? This is the voltage that uh, power would be sold to the grid at. For the 3.8, the cell I would recommend is between 52.8 and 53.2. So within that range, I think your batteries are sitting quite full, but they're still selling a lot of power to the grid that's not being slowed. says UL9540 on the slide. Uh, UL9540 and UL9540A are both applicable to our products. So we have the access unit and our boss cabinets not only have UL9540, but they also have 9540A. Um, that is a test that's been completed. The 9540A is a fire safety test. And 9540 results uh, relates to compatibility between the inverter and the battery bank. Uh, I understand, I need 450 would be incorrect. Means for battery disconnect under load for your batteries. Our batteries have a breaker on the top that's built in. Uh, it's a 100 amp breaker. 
So you can have a surge of 100 amps for up to 10 minutes before that thing will blow. And in addition, we've got a BMS that's gonna handle extreme overcurrent, like short circuit protection, things along those lines. What does Simplify offer for larger CNI installations? It's a great question. Um, we offer a high voltage battery that would allow for series connections, not our standard Phi product, but a separate product that can be series connected. This goes all the way from 200 to around 1200 volts DC. Uh, we've got a stack controller and a hybrid inverter that's going to be able to output three phase, 480, whatever you need. So this is more of a custom built to order solution. So definitely get in touch with us if you have a CNI project you're working on. Are you compatible with span smart panel? So I can change critical loads on the fly and eliminate installing the additional sub panel. Mark, that is a great question. We certainly are. Um, compatibility with the span would really rely on the inverter. It's it's totally compatible as far as the batteries are concerned. The span sub panel is a great addition to your system, allowing you to make the most of your battery bank. <coughs> the span sub panel is gonna help you really back up a lot more loads than you'd otherwise be able to. You might land you know, a lot of loads on that panel and the span will prevent all the loads from coming on at once and even prevent them from completely draining your battery bank, leaving you just enough power maybe for those really important loads like medical devices and computers. Any concerns with the voltage level on the Schneider system charging levels? Uh, the Schneider is able to be programmed pretty perfectly to our, our parameters for the battery charging. So, you know, as long as you follow our integration guide to a T, everything should be good to go. Can you comment on interconnection to your local utility and challenges you may have seen there? The interconnection to utilities, our batteries are definitely you know, perfect for that because of all their listings, they're able to be you know, pass inspection. E even in systems where a utility connection is present, it's not really dependent on the batteries though. The inverter really does all the work there as far as sending power to the utility and buying power from the utility. Um, we have not really had an issue in terms of interconnection. The main issue we see, it's always something we're overcoming is evolving um, UL listings and standards required for just permitting to get the installation in the first place. It's really not on the utility end in most cases, it's about the local jurisdiction for us. Um, I do see in the future that you know, utilities are probably going to want to be able to control customers' um, distributed assets. So that's something we're thinking about as we go forward and design new products, is how would this integrate with the utility if it needed to? Gail, is there a limit to the number of Phi batteries that can be connected in parallel? There is no limit to the number of Phi batteries that can be connected in parallel. We have seen systems of up to 500 kilowatt hours using those batteries alone. However, there is a limit with the Amplify batteries. Since they need to communicate with each other and with the inverter, there is a limit of 75 batteries in parallel. This is the maximum distance that the communications cable can reach before those communications are no longer effective. All right, hopefully that was able to answer your questions. Thanks for tuning in today and make sure to email me for NAVSET Prince.